Welcome back children. In this video, we are starting a new lesson. Lesson number 8, Ray Optics. Optics means the study of light. Ray Optics means the study of light as a set of rays, as a bundle of rays, or as beams of rays. You may wonder, having listened to me in lesson number 7, when I said that light is actually an electromagnetic radiation, an electromagnetic wave, you may ask me this question. If light is an electromagnetic wave, then how can you study light as a set of rays? How is even ray optics possible? Well, waves will have their own nature. There will be interference, there will be diffraction, there will be superposition of waves, which you have come across in the 11th standard. From superposition you get interference and from interference you know you, you get diffraction and stuff like that. So there are, these are the things that waves do, particularly transverse waves. But rays are like straight lines. How can you even study light as, as a set of straight lines after we know that it's, it's an electromagnetic wave? Well, it's permissible. You will understand that in lesson number 9. When we do lesson number 9, you will know and you will understand that it is permissible to study light as, as rays given certain reasonable distances. So within certain reasonable distances, these effects, the wave effects, the wave nature of light is not that predominant or uh, that important for you, that uh, perceivable. So you can, you can kind of ignore the wave nature of light and then start dealing with light as a set of rays. And this is how it was studied in the, uh, in, in the beginning. When light was, people started to study light, then they, they started to study it as, as a set of rays. I mean, when they were studying light and heat, and they, they thought they were two different phenomena. But now we know that they are the same phenomena, phenomena, electromagnetic waves. The only difference between light and heat is uh, the frequency range at which you, your body can, can sense these two things. The difference between light and heat is only in the frequency. Heat is infrared electromagnetic waves and, and light is in a certain range, the visible range. It is like the receiver difference. Light can be perceived by your eyes. Your eyes act as the receiver, the antenna for light. light. And the whole body acts as a receiver for infrared waves. So you can sense heat. All parts of your body can sense heat. But then it, it's only the difference in the receiver. It's like this. Your cell phone can receive mobile signals. And your uh, dish antenna can receive TV signals. It is the, the difference in the receiver, but the difference between the cell phone signals and the, the TV signals is only in the frequency. But when people started to study light and heat, they did not know any of these things. They took them as two different subjects and then developed these subjects. And finally, once we know 
that light and heat are one and the same in the sense that uh, the electromagnetic waves with the different frequencies, we are able to combine both of them. But historically, when people started studying light and heat, they were studying them as two different subjects. And ray optics was how it all started for light. And many of the ideas uh, that were discovered during the early stages of this study of light are still useful. So as I said, we are justified to study light as a, a set of rays. You will come across something called Fresnel distance later in, in, in lesson number 9 and when you come across that you know, yeah, you are justified. Even though you study it as a set of rays, nothing is going to change much. It's any difference between rays and waves in this range, in this distance range is, uh, uh, is, is negligible. Yeah. But a better picture would uh, of the of light would come only by treating that as a set of waves, but not as rays. But rays help you understand certain basic principles very easily. In this lesson, we will study about reflection, refraction and dispersion of light. And for reflection and refraction, we will be using plane and spherical surfaces only. Reflection can take place on any surface, any kind of surface. There is no rule that says it can happen only on a plane surface or a spherical surface. No, it can happen on any kind of surface, any rough surface too. But these are simple surfaces to study and we will be studying about the behavior of light on these surfaces. We will not touch upon other surfaces, but whatever you are studying as principles using these two surfaces can be employed, can be applied on any surface. But this just as application is going to be a little more complex than these surfaces. So we will be studying about reflection, refraction and dispersion. And the surfaces involved would be plane surfaces and spherical surfaces. This is what we will be doing in this lesson. Let's start with the law of reflection. So you have a reflecting surface. Let me take a plane surface. So this is a plane surface, a reflecting surface, like a mirror. If there is a ray, of light that comes and hits you at any point, doesn't matter which point, on the surface. If it hits here, it's going to get reflected. So because talking about ray optics, so there is a ray which comes and hits this ray surface and then gets reflected off of the surface. This ray is called as an incident ray. And this ray is called a reflected ray. Okay, now, the law of reflection tells you how these two things are related. The law of reflection tells you this. Well, if I draw a normal at this point on the surface, this is the point at which the light hits the surface. So at this point, I'm going to draw a normal. Normal to the surface. Normal to the surface. Then, it is like I have three lines. Right? There is one line, the instant ray, and then there is a second line, 
which is a reflected ray and now you have a third line that is the normal the imaginary line that you have drawn in your mind normal. The law of reflection says that the angle between the incident ray and the normal theta must be the same as the angle between the reflected ray and the normal. The incident angle is equal to the reflected angle. But that is not the only thing about it. Now comes the most important thing, which many people miss. This everybody knows. I, I if you call this as I, theta, and if you call it as R, I is the incident angle and R is the reflected angle. So, everybody knows that I is equal to R. But what is important in this is the incident ray and the reflected ray and the normal must lie on the same plane. Many people misunderstand this. When you say this incident ray, I will call this as capital I, I will call this as capital R, and then I will call this as N. When you say I, R, and N lie on the same plane, people tend to think that it is the plane of the, the mirror. No. That is not correct. They mean this plane, the vertical plane. Why? See, science is about precise definitions. Let me put it this way. I have a table in front of me right now on which I have kept the camera. So if I throw a ball onto the table, it will hit the table and then come to you. I can draw a normal here. I can draw a normal on the table. I will probably explain that with a book. So suppose this is the table, I am throwing a ball here. So that is the instant ray. The ball comes and hits here and then it, it reflects there. So now I can draw a normal, right? So the imaginary normal I have. You see, this I can measure this angle, the incident ray, and then this normal, the angle between those two. And now the reflected ray, I can measure the angle. Now I say, okay, this I is equal to R. So that's the law of reflection. No, the law of reflection is not complete with it. Why? Because you see, instead of coming like that, even if it comes and goes like this, there is a normal here. Instead of coming to you, the ball can hit. And what if the ball goes like this? In this direction? It can, you notice that it can still make an angle with the normal the same angle. You have an incident angle, so this ray comes and hits you. There is a normal. So this angle between these two can be the same as the angle between these two, the normal and this reflected ray. But now you notice, the ball is taking off like this. Would that happen? It won't happen. The surface is smooth, plain then it will hit the surface and then come to you. And notice that that is the plane you are talking about. So this plane. You see, in this plane, this is a plane, okay? This is a plane I'm referring to. And that plane is like this. In this plane, the normal and the incident ray and the reflected ray 
they are all here on this plane. If you see this, in total. But what if it takes off like this? What if what if some what if the ray hits here and then takes off like this? Then you see I have one plane where the incident ray, the incident ray and the normal are contained, and then there is another plane like this where the incident the reflected ray and the normal are contained. You see I have two planes now. This plane and this plane. Even then, even if you have two planes, this is possible. On one plane, I can have a particular angle and I can have the same angle on the other plane. It's like this. You see, if I this is, there are two planes, you can see it, right? This is one side and it's another side. So two planes, you can see it. Suppose this is a normal. This is a normal. Okay? Now, note here that this line, I make an angle theta, maybe 30 degrees or something, and then you see, and it can reflect like that, making same angle theta. This, this is a possibility. And here it is. Okay. So this will not happen. So what should you have? When I have a plane like this, this plane should continue like this. And then the reflection should be on this plane. So this must be the same theta. So this is single plane. That's what I mean here. So this is the plane. So all the three are on the same plane. If they are not on the same plane, this could be one plane and I know uh, after the normal and I can have a plane like that, they are also the ball can go like that. The ball will not go like that. The ball will come, hit here, and then go like this. So the normal, the incident ray, and the reflected ray, all of them will be on the same vertical plane. When they say they are on the same plane, they don't mean this plane. This plane is down. It's like this. They, these, these rays just touch. The, this plane, the plane of the mirror, they touch the plane. They don't lie on the plane. But take this plane, they all lie on the same plane. So this is a very important part. This is something that many people don't know, don't understand. They think when they say uh, the incident angle, the normal and the reflected angle, uh, incident ray, normal and the reflected ray lie on the same plane, they think it's a plane of the mirror. No. Those rays touch the plane. They don't lie on the plane. But if you take this vertical plane, then they all lie on the same plane. So this is the plane we're referring to. So that word is very important. The, that part of the definition is very important. The incident angle is equal to the reflected angle that everybody knows. And the incident ray, the normal and the reflected ray must lie on the same plane. And that plane is not the plane of the mirror. It's a vertical plane. If it is not so, then if I throw a ball, it may come to you or it may go like this. In both cases, it can meet this I is equal to all condition. But that is not a complete definition. The complete definition is this. The complete definition is I is equal to R and I, R and N lie on the same plane. This is the complete definition of the law of reflection. Don't stop with this. So we have the definition. Include this. This is very, very, very important. 
and when you include it, remember that it, this is not the plane of the mirror. It's a vertical plane. Think about it. Before we proceed, I want to talk about the sign conventions because sign conventions are going to make our life a little easier. Why do you even need sign conventions here? Is because if you don't have sign conventions, if you just take the distances as they are without the signs, then for different images, you may end up having different equations for focal lengths and other things. But if you are going to use sign conventions, you will be having only one equation that will handle all object image conditions. And that is the reason you will be using the sign conventions. I will explain that to you a little later, but let me go with the sign convention now. And when I do a couple of derivations, then you will understand why sign conventions are important. this. Um, suppose I have a, a spherical mirror. Okay. We will only be taking spherical mirrors. Okay. And uh, this is the axis of the mirror. And this point is called as P, the pole. Okay. Like so if I have an object here, object here, a light will come from the object and then hit the mirror. Right? The light will travel in all, all different directions. Okay. So I am, okay, uh, I'll come to that. So different directions, so like the light will come and hit you. Okay, panel light, and it may probably go just like that. All this you know from the 10th standard. I'll explain all that again. So, you are going to measure the distances from the pole. That is the first condition. That all distances are measured from the pole of the mirror or the lens. Okay. Or the center of the lens or the, the pole of the, the mirror. So this is where you are going to measure things from. So this is your origin. P is your origin. Suppose I want to find the distance. So how will I measure? I have to go like this to measure. Okay. See, I am going in this direction to measure. But which direction is the light traveling? From here, the light is traveling in this direction. If my measured distance is in, in the direction opposite to the direction of light, then I will consider that to be a negative distance. Suppose I measure continuously. I will consider this as negative to minus 10 centimeters. Because you see, the pole is my origin, and then I go from here and then measure 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's how I measure. I go in that direction. But light is traveling in this direction. So my measurement is in the opposite direction. So this 10 that I measure would be a negative 10, minus 10. Okay? And if I measure distances in the same direction as the direction of light, suppose I want to measure some distances. Let me take this point here. I'll call this as point C or something. No, let me call this as a point A. So from the whole, I'm going to measure it. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So let's say this, this is 8 centimeters or something. Which direction is the light traveling here from the object? This is the object I have. And light is traveling in this direction. And light direction is this. And I also measure this distance in the same direction. So this is positive. That does this sign convention we we'll use. So does it mean that everything here is negative? No. Take this case. Suppose I have 
I kick the mirror like this. Okay? Now the mirror is in this direction. Okay. Now where will I keep my object? I keep my object here. And how will the light travel? Light will travel in this direction. Which is my core. This is my core. And this is my object. And how will I measure the distance? Well, I will go in this direction. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, so maybe. This one will be 12 centimeters or something. But note here, from the pole I went in that direction, but light was traveling in this direction. So, this would be minus 1 from here. So, you have to keep this in mind. The reason is, it is not that if I, any, any, dist you know, any distance I measure on the left side of the page is negative and on the right side is positive. No, it's not like that. It doesn't matter which side you measure. The only condition that decides whether that is a positive measurement or a negative measurement is the direction of light. How have you kept your mirror? And which direction is light traveling? That direction is positive. And how are you measuring the distance from the pole? If you are measuring the distance in the opposite direction, then this is negative. So you see, in both cases, whether you keep the object here or here, it is negative because light is traveling to the mirror in this direction here and the light is traveling to the mirror in that direction. So don't automatically assume that anything to your left side would be negative and anything to the right side would be positive. That is not correct. This is negative, you can see. And this is negative. And clearly this will be positive. If you take a point A here, like that, now I'll get Say maybe if this is say 7 centimeters or something, this will be positive 7. That is about positive and negative when you measure distances. And what about the heights? I say if you have a the central axis here, the mirror, anything above the central axis is measured positive. Say 2 centimeter height. So, okay, 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter. How did I measure it? I measured it upwards, above this. This would be positive 2 centimeters height. Suppose it, it forms an you know, image somewhere here. Yeah, maybe something like this. So, I get, a, I get an image here. Object and then this is image. Right? So this side would be maybe 1 centimeter or something, but now this would be minus 1.5 centimeter or something. So you take the central axis, any measurement above the axis in the vertical direction is positive. Any measurement below the axis in the vertical direction is negative. And when it comes to horizontal directions, you have to consider the direction of light first. The direction of light is positive. And then you are going to measure your distances from the pole. You are not going to measure it from O. And if you measure it from O, what will happen? O to P will be positive. That, that cannot happen. You have to be very clear to the sign conventions. This is from where you are going to measure your horizontal distances, P. And if you go in the direction of light, then that is positive. If you go in the direction opposite to that of light, that is negative. So P is your origin. And when it comes to vertical distances, above the axis is positive. Below the axis is negative. Hope this is clear to you. And we have to talk about something called this paraxial lines or axial rays. I told you that we would be studying only about plane mirror and spherical plane surfaces and spherical surfaces, whether they are mirrors or um, refracting lenses. Okay, so the 
Suppose I take this mirror, okay? So this is mirror. And this is the center. This is the axis of mirror. Okay, so, so half the mirror is below, half the mirror is above. So that's the axis of the mirror. Okay? Now, what are paraxial rays? The paraxial rays are rays which are very close to the axis and they are almost parallel. They, are, they make very small angles with this axis. So this would be a paraxial ray. This would be a paraxial ray. Okay? And this would be a paraxial ray. And then, this would be a paraxial ray. So, these are rays which are very close to the axis. And they make very, very small angles with this axis. Think about this. What would be the angle between this ray and this ray? Very, very small, notice. And this ray and that ray. This, is, I mean, this ray and this ray is parallel. First of these are parallel. But now this will make a, a small angle with the axis. So, we are bothered about paraxial rays. We are not going to consider something else. For example, suppose this this is how the, uh, the mirror is. And I am not going to bother about this one. This is too far away from the, the axis. Why? You know, so that only if I consider paraxial rays, all my equations will be correct. We will we'll discuss it a little later. Yeah. But keep this in mind. This is not paraxial ray. Paraxial rays meaning they are rays which are very close to the axis of the mirror and they may make small angles with the axis. Small angles, that is important. They are very close to the axis and they make very small angles with So those are the things that called as paraxial rays. Okay. So with that in mind, let's go on to, to derive an expression for the focal length of a spherical mirror. Let's come up with an expression for a spherical mirror, the focal length. Let's say this is the sphere. This is a sphere. So what I'm going to do, out of the sphere, I'm going to cut a portion. Maybe I'll cut this portion. So this is my mirror. Okay. So I probably make a track a little better. Something like this. This is my mirror. And this is the center, right? The center of the sphere. And if I draw a straight line, then that becomes the axis, right? It becomes the axis. So this is going to be my P. Okay. And this is my center. I'll call this as C. So this is the mirror. So now, now that I've got this, I can ignore everything else because I've cut that piece out of a, a sphere. So this is what I've got here. So what I'm going to do? Okay, let me take a line, a ray, a light ray, parallel to this axis. So my light ray is parallel to this axis. Comes and hits you. Okay, it's not really parallel. Something like that. Okay, so the light ray hits you. What is it going to do? This is parallel to the axis. What is it going to do? You don't tell me that it's going to go through the focal length, the, the focal point. No. That we don't know. We haven't talked about any of those things yet. What do we know now? 
we know only the law of reflection. What does it say? The incident angle must be equal to the reflected angle. I must be equal to R. But to measure I and R, we require a normal. Right? So if I hit here, what would be the normal for this, this surface? If I take a sphere, if I draw a normal at any point on the sphere, then that normal will go through the center. Right? So, my normal will go through the center. This is my normal. That's, that's, this is the radius. Okay? So, this is the point M at which this ray hits. And this is my normal. Okay? My normal. Which goes through the center. That's the radius action. Normal to a sphere, nothing but the radius extended. So, what do you get? Now I, I have, this is my i, or I call this as theta. What do we know? This is i, this is equal to theta. Then, it must reflect from that position. When it reflects, then the reflected angle must be equal to the incident angle. So, I should have another theta here. This is my reflected ray. Okay, so this has gone through this point on, this, on the axis. It's gone like that. Okay, that's all I know. I don't know anything else. I don't know about focal length, nothing. The focal point, I have no idea. This is all I know. If a ray comes and hits here, like at any angle, doesn't matter, then the incident angle must be equal to the reflected angle. I've taken a parallel ray, it hits there, and then this is what we get. Okay? Fine. I'll call this as a point F. I'm not saying what it is. Now let me take another ray. This ray goes along the axis itself. Then what will happen? It should get reflected. The incident angle must be equal to the reflected angle again. But here, what's the normal? Normal is this. This radius. The normal is this. So there is no angle between the incident ray and then the normal. So zero. So it will get reflected right back. So it will retrace this path. It will go hit here and then it will come back in this direction. You see, as this ray comes back, notice that it meets this ray in this the same the point. So this junction point is F. And I can do the same thing for anything else. Okay? I can probably take another ray, this time like this. Another parallel ray. And again, I can draw another R. This will be normal now. Then this angle, maybe some, some other angle. And, and then it will come back, and as it comes back, then it will go via this. You see that. The law of reflection has to be obeyed at all points. That is all we know. Light doesn't care about, you know, after hitting here, then I should go through the focal length. No, it doesn't care about that. All it knows is, yeah, this is how I travel, I hit here, then I should reflect, and I should make the same angle. That's all it knows. Okay, if at all I can know anything. So it goes and it, it hits here and then goes through this focal point. And then and I take another ray and goes to that point. So it, this is a junction. This is where all these lines join. So I'll call this now as the focal point. Okay? So now let's see. Um, let's do this. Let me draw this stuff. I'll call this as D or something. Okay, some 
So I made a rectangle out of it. I just dropped a straight line from that point. Okay, so there is a gap between D and P. Okay. Now, what is my what is this angle? This angle is going to be 2 theta. When you see this theta plus theta 2 theta and then you get here and this must be 2 theta, right? So it's like this. Using this rule. Yeah? If this angle theta, this must be theta. If this is 2 theta, this must be 2 theta. So this is 2 theta, so this must be 2 theta. Okay? And this This is an order. So I want you to consider the triangle FMD. The triangle FMD. What is tan 2 theta? Uh, tan 2 theta? So tan 2 theta is equal to MD by So now, I want you to consider triangle CMD. CMD. So you see, this is theta. If this is theta, and this must be theta. Right? Use the same logic here. I get two parallel lines and then one line, you know, intersecting both of them. So this angle must be equal to this angle. So delta C and So tan theta. So tan theta is equal to the same MD now by C D. Now, now comes the significance of paraxial lines. If what did we say as paraxial lines? Lines which are very close to the axial, the axis of the mirror, and making small angles. So no notice if this line is very close to this axis, then this side of theta will be very, very, very small. And this is why we even define paraxial lines. So, if you are talking about paraxial lines, then these angles will be very small. Because those angles are very small, you can see this, right? For this line, this was theta. But then when I took another line, this angle was smaller than that. So, the closer the line gets to the axis, then the smaller this angle will become. Theta will become smaller and smaller and smaller. As this as these lines come close to the axis. So you are concerned about the paraxial lines. So all your equations will be applicable only to paraxial lines. That's, that's what I'm coming to say. So now, because they are paraxial lines, because they are paraxial, paraxial lines, which are very close to the axis, then the angle is very small, and for small angles, what do we know? For small angles, theta, for small angles, tan theta will be written as theta. And we also know that sine theta is equal to theta. So this we have come across previously, and now we are coming across this. It makes sense because sine theta is equal to theta. For small angles, cos theta will be 1. And small angles are almost close to zero. So cos theta will be 1. So sin theta is theta. And cos theta is close to 1. So tan theta will be theta again. So sin theta and tan theta will have the same value for very small angles. Approximately the same value for very small angles. Okay. So for small angles, tan theta is equal to theta. So if I, because I've taken only paraxial lines, I can say that tan 2 theta is simply theta. 2 theta is equal to 
and the ref is y that is because tan 2 theta is equal to 2 theta because of the small angles you know, the total praxial lines so then md by ft 2 theta is equal to md by ft so that gives you tan theta in this case of this triangle okay is equal to theta is equal to md by ft okay so md by c md by c okay. so this is my equation 1 and this is my equation 2 if i divide 1 by 2 what I am going to get is equal to 2 theta by theta equal to nd by fd by nd by c. You see, this is gone, this is gone. And this becomes cd by fd. What is cd? cd Okay, CP is R radius, right? CP is the radius of the sphere. Now remember, I drew a circle. So CP is actually the radius of the sphere. Radius of the sphere. But you see, if they are paraxial, if these lines are paraxial, then they will be very close to the axis that this will be, this difference becomes negligible. Clearly, if it took a, you know, took another line, you know, like suppose my mirror is like this, really curved, it's really curved, then if I take this line, and if this is my outer, you know, like the, the, the circumference is here, the periphery is here, and this point if I take, then there will be a big gap. But if they are very close, very close to the axial line, then this distance can be ignored. So I can say that C D is almost equal to C P. So this I will say as C P. And again, F D is almost equal to F P. All this is true only if you are considering paraxial lines. If you are not considering paraxial lines, these equations will not hold good. If you are considering paraxial lines, the angles they make with the axis are small, so tan theta can be written as theta. And if you are using paraxial lines, the distance you measure from C to D is almost the same as the distance you measure from C to P. CD is almost equal to CP. So, this happens only in the case of paraxial lines, and that is why we talked about paraxial lines first. Okay, so once you get this, what is CP? CP is R, right? So, I cancel this, I say 2 is equal to R by FP. This distance I am going to call as the focal length F. Like R, since CP, CP is called as R, CP is R, and say FP is F, the focal length. I am going to use a single letter, a symbol to denote this distance. Because everything is going to go through this now, you can see that. So, this is equal to R by F. So the focal length F is equal to R by 2. So if someone gives you the radius of the mirror, the spherical mirror, we can immediately calculate the focal length by dividing it by 2. If the radius is 20 centimeters, then the focal length must be 2 centimeters. So you take a spherical mirror take a spherical shape, a glass, a spherical glass and then you cut a part of it, a small part of it and if you know the radius 
you know that if you silver this glass on the other side, then you get a mirror, then that mirror will have a focal length of r by 2. This is valid only for paraxial lines. So if you want a reasonably uh, a big mirror, okay, don't take this, don't take the surface and cut it like this. Useless. Well, you see, these lines are not paraxial. The way that it is here is not paraxial. You see, there is a huge difference. This won't work. But if I take a really big mirror, like that, okay, really, really, really big mirror, uh, like that, okay, I am just trying only one point, okay, and it goes and it completes here, okay. Then, if I take this, you see, it's almost flat, almost flat, it was this light, very, very, very small angle. Now, you see, this is almost close to this. See, but you, you, you are going to get more and more paraxial rays. The same length, if you take this, all these rays, these rays are, for this mirror, only so much would be paraxial. But for this mirror, you see, so much, a lot of it, a lot of rays can become paraxial. So if you want a big mirror, don't cut it off of a small sphere just because you, know, you have this this won't work for this mirror but if you need this size mirror you need this size mirror well then take it off of a much bigger sphere so all rays that fall on that mirror will behave like paraxial rays okay. because the radius is somewhere there Hope this is clear to you. And this is the expression that you have to remember. The focal length of a spherical mirror is equal to half the radius. This is for axial lines.